Wind energy was considered an important part of Ontario's Green Energy Act when it was introduced by Dalton McGuinty's Liberal government in 2009. But six years later, the jury is still out as to whether wind has delivered on both its environmental and economic promises. Joining us now to help analyze that, in Guelph, Ontario via Skype, Ross McKittrick, Professor of Economics at the University of Guelph and Senior Fellow at the Fraser Institute. With us here in studio, Jane Wilson, President of Wind Concerns Ontario. Brandy Janetta, Ontario Regional Director of the Canadian Wind Energy Association. And Judith Lipp, President of the Federation of Community Power Cooperatives. And we are happy to welcome all of you to TVO tonight. Ross, good to have you on the line as well from Guelph. Thank you. We want to start by just showing a couple of charts to show how the situation in the province has changed from several years ago to today. So, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring these charts up. Here is Ontario's energy output back in 2009, so we're going back six years now. And you can see on the right-hand part of that chart, we are overwhelmingly dependent on nuclear power for more than half our supply here, hydroelectric power for about a quarter. There was coal still burned in the province of Ontario back then, so a little chunk for that, and gas. And there's wind at just 1.9% of Ontario's energy output. Fast forward to 2014, we are still very dependent on nuclear and hydroelectric, as that shows. Coal is virtually gone, and wind is now up to 4%. So not a huge chunk of our output, but still bigger. Let's start with this. Ross, to you first. There is an increase in wind power, and I want to know if you think that's good. Uh, yeah, the, the wind power went up, but uh, no, because it cost a huge amount, and as you can see, we got a trivial amount of electricity for it. Most of that power output, by the way, was introduced into the grid at times when it wasn't even needed because there's a surplus of baseload power when the wind blows. So about 80% of that power was exported at a loss to the U.S. You can see that about 80 to 90% of our electricity is from hydro and nuclear, which are non-emitting sources to begin with. So it's not like we have a highly polluting electricity grid anyway. All that's really happened is there's been an expansion of natural gas to replace the coal-fired power and uh, the winds and solar outputs remain below 5%. They're really not important contributors, but they are costing a lot to Ontario. They now cost about 20% of the commodity cost for power, so it's, it's turned out to be a pretty bad deal economically for the province. All right, let's go around on this. Judith, your view. Uh, well, I actually think this is a, there's a really exciting trend happening. Uh, Ontario is part of that. It's part of a global trend, which is that we're on our way to transitioning to a renewable energy economy. It's ab absolutely imperative that we do so. Um, what the chart doesn't show is really energy is changing all the time. Um, the, the, the intake and the, you know, the output is really dependent on, for instance, how much the wind is blowing. So on any given day, that percentage of wind could be much higher. I think what the chart doesn't, the story the chart doesn't tell uh, is really that since 2003, when the province decided to cl close the coal plants, renewable energy has entered into that gap that was created. And that's really the, that's the real story because what the, that, what's behind that decision of closing the coal plants was a health decision, it's a climate change decision, it's about taking our responsibilities uh, seriously and moving forward. So uh, it's, you can't just ask whether wind is a good idea, you've got to look at the full picture, you've got to look at what are the benefits that have been provided. And in your view, the benefits outweigh the downside? Well, absolutely. Wind is one of the most competitive electricity sources uh, for new generation globally. And we are well on our way in this province to take part in that benefit, that economic benefit, but also the social and environmental benefits. Jane Wilson, your view? Well, I think looking at the whole picture is a great idea. And uh, we're in favor of renewable energy. But in this case, what's been missed in terms of wind power is the fact that it's a high impact or a very invasive source of power for low benefit. So the impact on people has been missed out in Ontario and I think that's covered in the film that we're going to see. It is covered in the film and we'll have some discussion about it as well uh, later in the program tonight. Randy, your view. Definitely think wind power has a role to play within the supply mix in Ontario. The chart shows, uh, you know, 4% right now and uh, just just to Judith's point and uh, Mr. McKittrick's point earlier, it's not insignificant and it certainly is an important part. It plays a role. Uh, the system operator in Ontario has taken wind uh, and used it to help balance those surpluses that we're seeing um, in order to become more flexible and nimble. Um, is certainly the environmental aspect of it being you know, a clean energy source. Um, it's increasingly cost competitive with other new sources and it was, it's timely. Um, so in the 
timeline that it took to phase out the coal plants, we saw the wind fleet grow in Ontario to the level that it's at today. It will continue to grow over the course of the next several years and it will continue to play an important role in providing the flexibility and in modernizing our grid. Okay, many things to pick up on there. Ross, let me go to you first. I heard you say it was not cost competitive. I've heard both Brandy and Judith say it is actually becoming increasingly cost competitive. Who's right here? Well, think of it this way. If you take the province's environmental goals at face value, just the numbers that they put out, you could have achieved those goals a whole bunch of different ways. Back in 2005, they worked out the cost of achieving those goals using conventional air pollution systems and staying with our existing power grid. And that would have worked out to about a tenth of the cost that we've incurred so far with the Green Energy Act approach using wind and solar. And the Green Energy Act approach hasn't yet replaced all the power we lost through closing the coal-fired power plants. If they really add all the wind energy they're saying they will, the, that uh, ratio will go up to about 70 times the cost of the alternative option. So that's why it doesn't really make sense. Even if you take the environmental goals at face value, they could have done this much less in a much less expensive way and uh, avoided all the other problems that uh, Jane Wilson has alluded to in the rural areas of the expansion of these wind turbine systems that are really having a, a huge negative effect on rural Ontario. Randy, you want to come back on that? Sure. I mean, we've, we're actually right now see, realizing the benefits that wind energy projects are bringing to the local communities that they operate in. Wind developers work with the municipal uh, leadership in order to create very innovative ways to ensure that those benefits are realized, not just through land lease agreements to property owners or property taxes, which are part of any industrial uh, commitment within a community. They're also realizing community benefits through, you know, partnership agreements with First Nations, uh, municipal equity agreements, so that the community benefits are realized at home in the areas where those projects are operating. Jane, we're going to leave the health effects to, to the side for now because we're going to devote a portion of the discussion to come on that. But in terms of the environmental slash economic benefits, which people have talked about, do you dispute that wind has brought those? Yeah, I do, and I think two auditors general in, in Ontario over the past few years since uh, 2012 have said there's never been a real cost-benefit study, which looks at the, the impact on, on people, on the community. So we've got things like property value loss and the social costs that have come. The communities have been split apart, and, and no one's arguing that. it's uh, you know. So you might get a skating rink, but what happens if you've got people who are friends and and families for decades and who are now not speaking. So there's been a, a, a cost and it, other ways that have not been looked at. Judith, uh, it's undeniable that this issue has split communities and divided friends, relatives, families. Has it been too big a price to pay in that regard for whatever environmental or economic benefits you think have accrued to this? Well, I guess it's hard to assess that. I mean, we have to look at the bigger picture, as I've mentioned. Um, so we are in an environmental crisis. We have a climate catastrophe sort of, you know, looming. And we need to make some difficult choices. So everybody understands that when you make infrastructure choices, there are going to be people who are for it and people who are against it. Uh, I guess the way I would come at the question is really, how can we mitigate the possibility of those tensions within a community and that's really where the, you know, the, the sector that I work with, the community power sector, is really trying to demonstrate a different path. Uh, basically saying that communities need to be given an opportunity to own a piece of the project that is going up in their neighborhood, in their community. They need to have a financial stake in it. And we see this in, in jurisdictions where that is a, uh, a dominant model. Scotland is, is a forerunner in this area. Germany, for sure, half the wind turbines in Germany are owned by the citizens of the country, and we're talking, you know, 20,000 megawatts of wind potentially. Okay. So these I, are huge numbers, right? So I will want to come back to this a little bit later, but I, I, I do want to raise the issue, Brand, Brandy. I'll raise it with you that I that I hear more than anything else, which is, you know, the nuclear power plants pretty much always work, except when they're mothballed and they're fixing them up. But the fact is, we're so overly dominant on nuclear. Nuclear is always there. You know, Niagara Falls is always pumping those turbines. It's not always windy. Sometimes it's not windy. Uh, should we be concerned about relying too much on our energy split on a source of energy that's not always there? I think it's important to remember, like I said earlier, Steve, is that wind offers a flexibility into the system that didn't exist prior to renewables being integrated. So we do have a reliance on nuclear for baseload. Absolutely. Hydroelectricity has a role to play. 
Wind energy and other renewables on the grid play a very important role. It's, it's about modernizing the grid, providing emissions-free electricity that are not, is not subject to the commodity you know, volatility pricing um, for fuel pricing. And it's not ever going to be subject to a carbon pricing mechanism such as natural gas, we, as we see, you know, helping to fill those gaps. So but we also can't rely on it, really, for baseload power, can we? I don't think that it's ever intended to be a baseload supply. It's supposed to be part of a balanced supply mix, and it certainly fills that role in Ontario. And it will, as it continues to grow and become more prevalent, uh, the system operator will continue to look to wind energy in particular to help balance the system. And that is probably the most significant role that it can play and it will ever be intended to play. So, Ross, if it's not meant to be baseload, and if it's only meant to play the role it's meant to play, but not the role it's not meant to play, does that mitigate against any of your objections? Uh, think of it this way, nobody in Ontario was willing to build wind turbines until the government started throwing money at people to do it. Uh, and the power that we're getting from the wind energy system, most of it is coming at times like the middle of the night in the fall when it's very windy in Ontario, but that's when power demand is at a minimum. When our power demand is at a maximum, it's on the hot days in the summer when everybody's running air conditioning and the wind energy grid only gener generates about 7% of its capacity at that point. Well, let me jump so, in on that analogy for a second because nobody was building nuclear power plants in Ontario until the government was yeah. prepared to throw billions at those as well. So what, 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 well, what value is that coming? I'm not trying to defend subsidies for nuclear power either. But remember, we started this process with a surplus of baseload already. And when they shut down the coal-fired power plants, those were largely replaced by the natural gas that you need because you need to replace coal with something that's flexible and completely under control. You can't replace coal with something that's subject to random fluctuations in wind because the power system just can't cope with that. What the wind energy is doing is it's coming into the system when there's already surplus baseload. And most of the, as I've pointed out, and these are figures that you can get off the IESO website itself, about 80% of the on, power. Hang on, we, we, we're, we're an acronym-free zone here, Ross. Oh, You're sorry. talking about the Independent, independent electric Electricity system, system Operator. Good, yes, okay. About 80% of the power that the wind energy grid is generating comes into the system when there's already a surplus of baseload power, so it can't be used. And we export it at a large loss to the U.S. So at this point, it doesn't make any sense to expand capacity for wind because we can't use the power we're already getting from it. Judith. Uh, yeah, I guess what we're hearing is a common misconception about the electricity system. What we need to understand is there is always surplus p power capacity built within any system because the nature of demand is fluctuating. So the, the electricity system is inherently in flux. The inter independent electricity system operator's job is to maintain the balance between demand and supply. And what we're now learning, because the predictability of wind is becoming increasingly stronger, what we're hearing from utilities is that, in fact, they much prefer to deal with the fluctuations that wind provides because each individual generator is quite small compared to, for instance, a large generator. And I'll give a very, very recent example. Point La Pro is a 600 megawatt nuclear power plant in New Brunswick. It's gone offline for two weeks. So, and that represents 15% of the power in New Brunswick. So for that province to make up a 15% uh, reduction unexpected is, is a that's, That's a, a real deal. problem. Whereas wind and solar and a, a lot of the hydro projects, renewable energy is inherently produced close to demand. It's inherently, it, it is in flux. We can predict when the wind blows, when the sun shines. We, this is all part of our, our atmospheric uh, forecasting. And utilities increasingly are recognizing the value that this fluctuation presents for the system. Okay. So I think it's always short-sighted to just, again, pick one little piece and say there's surplus power, there's always been surplus power at different times Understood. because we have an inflexible nuclear power generator that cannot be switched on and off. Understood. Okay. Brandy, how much does one of those things cost to buy and put up? I actually can't say because right now in Ontario we have we don't have as consistent um, cost per se per turbine. There's a competitive um, there's a competitive manufacturing base in Ontario, so if you're a smart developer, you're going to shop around and you're going to shop around for the best, uh, you know, the best bang for your okay. buck. Does anybody know? Does anybody know how much what these things cost? Well, I'm not really sure what the value of that question is, to be honest with I'm you. I'm trying to get a better understanding of, you know, I, I know that Darlington costs $16 billion, so I have a sense about right. what a nuclear, a set of nuclear reactors cost to build. But so I haven't got a clue what these things cost to build. Right, but the issue isn't how much does a single turbine cost, how electricity pricing is 
considered in any policy making framework, they look at the levelized cost of electricity. So they basically say, what does it cost to build the plant, to maintain the plant? What is the cost of the fuel inputs? What's the cost of decommissioning? And then they compare that on a per kilowatt basis. And that's the price that's interesting. To just say that it costs us $3 million to put, a put up a wind turbine. Is that what it is? I'm picking a number. Oh, Certainly okay. the wind turbine that was built by the community in downtown Toronto in 2002 cost around $2 million. So some of those prices will have changed. You know, we're now dealing with a global competitive wind industry, et cetera. So those prices have definitely come down. My point really is being, what does that tell you? Darlington costing $26 billion or a wind turbine costing $3 million, it doesn't tell you anything unless you understand, first of all, what's the cost per kilowatt hour, but also what are the hidden costs? So for nuclear power, what, the, what people in this province don't understand is there's no long-term storage solution. There is there, the insurance for a catastrophe is underwritten by the province. These are all costs that the wind industry bears. They have to decommission their projects. They have to have insurance. So this is where that apples, no, that's, there's, that, that's there's no apples comparison. to apples comparison I, that, that's happening on price on, in energy in this province. I, I appreciate that that's a fair comparison. So let's, let's do the apples to apples comparison, which is, I think the cost of creating a kilowatt hour of nuclear power in this province is four or five cents? No, 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 is that's it, what old is it plants. You can't compare built plants to new plants because okay. we're talking about refurbishing Darlington. We're so talking what's your about, number? So the number that is being projected by California Energy Commission, so you know, you know, energy bodies, is in the 15 cents per kilowatt range, and wind comes well under that. It come, we, in fact, Quebec is, has just issued an RFP, so a competitive tender for wind, and the prices are coming in at 6.6 .6 cents a kilowatt hour. So, wind is hugely competitive already. Ross, give me your numbers. What's what? What's a kilowatt hour of nuclear cost versus wind in your view? Actually, Steve, what you're getting at is there has never been a proper cost-benefit analysis associated with wind, and this was a point the Auditor General of Ontario made. So why we have to pull numbers out of thin air in the middle of a TV interview instead of just looking it up, the province should have done this work long ago before they even started the implementing the Green Energy Act. The, the wholesale price of electricity in Ontario right now is about three or four cents per kilowatt hour. What we pay has got little to do with that, though. It's mostly something called the global adjustment which is an add-on to the cost of electricity per hour, which is used to pay all the revenue guarantees that go to generating sources, a lot of them connected to renewables, uh, but also nuclear and hydro facilities. And we're really not paying market prices anymore for electricity. We're paying centrally planned prices through the global adjustment mechanism. And the report that Tom Adams and I did for the Fraser Institute last year showed that Every addition of wind capacity in Ontario is bumping up the global adjustment. And so as long as we keep adding wind capacity, we're going to see that go up. Additions of, of hydro are also having a large positive effect. And it was removing the coal-fired power plants that also pushed up the global adjustment. So, Okay. Jane, would um, you agree that the 80 cents per kilowatt hour, for example, that the province of Ontario once upon a time paid people to manufacture solar power to get an industry going, that those days are long gone and nobody's paying those kinds of outrageous rates anymore and that renewables are more, what's the word I'm looking for, competitive with the, the, the nuclear. The solar example is really, and I'm not a power expert, but the solar example is really interesting because it started off at 80 uh, around there and then the province said, you know, we're paying too much and we're going to drop that down to 50 something and the solar industry didn't kick at all. Why? Because they knew it was too high. They were getting too much money. Hmm. But again, to me, the social costs, again, have not been considered. What is the cost of turning Ontario's rural communities into industrial zones? No one has looked at that. Although, w would, would you acknowledge that there are many farmers in the province who were happy to have these turbines on their land because they're money makers for them? Some have been and others are consulting lawyers on how to get out of their leases. Um, the other thing is we had a group leader down in the Ridgetown area. She did a look at who's got turbines on their land and I believe she came up with the figure of 70% were non-resident landowners. So these are people who are investing in land instead of for crops, they're putting turbines on them. So it's not necessarily this myth of the, the little old family farm and oh, they're getting an extra 15,000. That, that's not necessarily the truth. Ross, can you talk about what kind of economic impact the introduction of wind power has had on the bottom line of the province of Ontario? 
Yeah, I did a study two years ago for the Fraser Institute looking at the price trajectory altogether for the province. And so we have seen electricity prices go from the 5 and 6 cent per kilowatt hour range up to the 10 to 12 per, uh, cent per kilowatt hour range. And then they are forecast to continue going up. Um, I estimate that's cut the rate of return to manufacturing in Ontario by about 30 percent. Um, the uh, mitigating factor there, though, is the large power consumers in Ontario did negotiate a special deal with the province. They split the global adjustment into two classes, Class A and Class B customers. The Class A customers are the big industries, the very large businesses, and they're now shielded from the worst increases of the global adjustment. But those costs are now uh, dumped on the Class B customers, who are the smaller businesses and households. So the effect on manufacturing has been mitigated somewhat, but that just means the effect on small businesses and households is even worse. Okay, we got some feedback in the studio to that. Uh, you first, Judith, and then I want to hear from Brandy as well. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, what's important to understand is given that renewable energy has represents a small proportion of the overall supply mix in the province to date, when we talk about the, in, the increasing prices of, of electricity in the province, you have to look at it in a proportion. So what people forget to understand is that OPG, which is the Ontario Power Generation, which owns the nuclear power fleets in this province, asked for a 30% rate increase because they wanted to maintain a certain return on investment. So when you look at the analysis from the perspective of what's the proportional increase uh, or what, um, what is each source uh, contributing to the increase, mm -hmm. we can basically we can basically see that w wind and solar combined are only adding 14 percent to the rate increase, and and that the other increases you know are are proportional. So nuclear, 30 percent that I mentioned, and so on. So again, the analysis is always it's it's always about picking you know picking the perspective that you want to highlight, and you know that's common uh, for sure. But I think. It's false. People need to understand that that it's impossible for wind and solar to have created all the increases because it's such a small there proportion. A small slice of the mix. Yeah. Okay. Having said that, I remember former Premier Dalton McGuinty sitting Brandy right in that chair there, and I, I remember asking him about the Green Energy Act and why are you, why are you doubling down on this thing? You know, there's a lot of unhappiness out there about it, and his answer was, we got to pick a lane. Uh, you, you, no, we're not going to be in 25 different things. We got to pick a lane. This is the lane I'm picking. He said. And we want to be the best in the world at renewables. And if we have to pay a little more to shut down coal and stop kids from getting asthma, then we're going to do it. Does that ring as true today, do you think, as uh, now that we've got six years of facts to rely on, as it did back then? Well, certainly the Green Energy Act, and in particular the feed-in tariff program that resulted from that act, was intended to kickstart an industry to enable investments in renewable energy generation in Ontario. Has it done that? I would argue yes. Um, are we on the path to continue? Absolutely. We're are we in. paying too much for being on that path? What we have seen, Steve, is a continuous decrease, 58% uh, in fact, in the levelized cost of, of energy um, as a result of wind energy costs to develop and build wind and have it generate for a long-term uh, contract. So what we know now um, is that that kickstart that we saw under the feed-in tariff program has, has generated manufacturing investments. It's generated the fleet that we have today as well as future opportunities. What we have now is a competitive opportunity in Ontario. So we have the infrastructure in place, we have the investments in place in Ontario, we have the global investment community interested in coming to Ontario as the North American leader in wind energy development. So we certainly have been able to enable an industry um, and we're well situated to continue that path. Sheldon, let's show a map. I'm on the middle of page three here. Let's show a map of the southern part of the province of Ontario and we can sort of give you an indication here of where many of these turbines are. You can see the largest preponderance of them in southwestern Ontario on the shores of Lake Erie and Lake St. Clair, some up the eastern shores of Lake Huron. They go, uh, we were in Thunder Bay just a few, uh, few weeks ago, and there are some as far north as Thunder Bay, and as far east as close to Ottawa there. Uh, I guess the first thing I want to ask you, Jane, on this is how much community involvement and say was there in those turbines going where they ended up? Zero. That people, they have the, you know, public meetings and whatever, but 
they're not open question and answer situations. Uh, and whatever questions people ask, there's no guarantee that the answers go anywhere or mean anything. Um, you can have all community involvement you want in the public meetings you want, but the, the end result was the communities never got to say anything. Do you think the community should have a veto on these wind turbines? Well, again, I think when you start talking about cost-benefit analysis, and again, it wasn't done at the community level, uh, and people don't have a say as to where things go, they don't have a say as to whether they were going to be there in the first place. So you end up with turbines way too close to homes, too close to schools. You have children living with the noise all day and all night. Uh, there just was no community feedback at all, no decision making. And okay, I get you. And, and that was the McGuinty government's policy. Was that? Mm -hmm. I mean, he went around Ontario saying, "I'm not going to be dissuaded by NIMBYism. Where we need these things, we're putting them up. Period. Full stop." He did say, you know, not within certain distances of properties and that kind of thing. But again, to my question, if a local municipality, the town council of town, whatever decides that they don't want a wind turbine in their community, should they be allowed to veto provincial policy on that? I would say yes. They would have to have uh, you know, a good case, put the case forward as to why. But why is it coming from the top down and telling people, yes, you're turning into a wind power factory? Mm -hmm. If it was any other kind of infrastructure, that would not be happening. I'll get some more comments from everybody in a second. But first, we've been talking about this documentary all night long that we're about to play after we get off the air. Big wind. Let's watch a clip. Roll tape, please, Sheldon. If we had a more open process where, you know, citizens were more involved, farmers who got together and said, we want to build one of these projects, how are we going to do it? I mean, this is the kind of thinking that makes sense because if you want to build a project, you still can. But you have to convince residents that you're not hurting their interests to do it. The argument that some people are allowed to get sick that some properties can be devalued, that some animals have to be sold off the farm because it's no longer safe for them to live there, is the opposite of what the most successful countries have done. Brandy, do you think there was inadequate community consultation in the installing of these wind turbines? I certainly understand that there's discontent. Um, we have, it's interesting that you showed that map actually where the greatest concentration of turbines exist in Ontario right now, which is southwestern Ontario. We have a municipal government in southwestern Ontario that has taken this up as an opportunity to increase economic development opportunities within that region. Which one? Chatham-Kent. Okay. So the municipality of Chatham-Kent has the greatest concentration of wind turbines to date in Ontario. Um, the mayor and the municipal council there have, like I said, taken it, this as an opportunity. They pursued renewable energy opportunities before before the feed and tariff program as well as throughout and they're continuing to do so now that we're into a more competitive bidding process. So that is an example of a community where wind energy works and where we have a very engaged municipal leadership as well as at the community level. You will acknowledge there are plenty of other communities that do not feel as romantic about these turbines as Chatham-Kent does. Absolutely, Steve. And as an industry association representative, we took it upon ourselves to create the industry's first international best practices in community engagement. Um, it stemmed out of some of that discontent, absolutely, but we made it our, our mission and our mandate to engage with municipal leaders, with community leaders, with experts in the field of siting and uh, development in order to create a best practices for community engagement. So it's something that, as the industry we recognize and value as, as very meaningful. Um, it is the key to a successful wind energy project, absolutely. Ross, if it's provincial policy that the government of Ontario wants these things in, should local municipalities be given a veto to prevent them from being in? I think the planning process for wind turbines should look like the planning process for any large building project in a region. If I want to put a high-rise apartment building in my neighborhood, as some people do, I can't just put it up. I have to go through a long planning process that involves extensive community consultation and yes the city can veto it. If the city isn't satisfied with the effects on the neighborhood and the, the sight lines and things like that they can override it and then there are appeal processes through the municipal board but there is no provincial level flattening of the process that leaves people out. It's the Green Energy Act that brought in a new process and people don't have a local say in the way that they would for any other large-scale building project in their region. And that's one of the reasons that you're seeing so much aggravation and so much frustration. Judith, was it problematic for the McGuinty government not to give or not to offer a local veto to towns that didn't want these things? Well, I guess that we come at this from a slightly different perspective. So the community that I work with, it's called the community power sector. 
And our model is really about enabling, and I said this before, and I do think it's a really important point to understand because I, it addresses exactly what was commented on in that clip that we saw, which is essentially if you allow individuals to participate in the process, if you give them, allow them to have a stake, and they have to buy into that, it's their choice. Um, and we use the cooperative model. It's uh, an age-old uh, social enterprise model that's been used for 200 years. We use that uh, to allow members of the community to become uh, a member of the co-op that then becomes a partner with a project. Mm -hmm. uh, and for us, I think there has been a problematic about how some of these policies have rolled out. I think there has not been given enough consideration for communities to be able to participate in a meaningful way. I do agree that some of these consultations, depending on who's executing them, and again, there, there are, there's good development and there's bad development. That doesn't matter what sector you're in. And I think some develop, developers have recognized the need to really listen and understand the needs of the community and to address that, and others have perhaps not done their total due diligence on that. Um, I think what would be a really good move in this province, given the tension that we have around wind development, given the ongoing commitment to it, is that we really look at the best practices for community involvement around the world. So who's doing that? So Scotland is a really interesting case um, where they are, the government is essentially providing supports to the community so that they can participate in a meaningful way, because the other challenge is communities don't know the power sector, so they need some capacity building to happen. But they're also developing what they call a registry of community benefits. And so now a community can understand what is it that companies are offering, and they can actually start to demand these things, and right? What, what are the potential benefits? Well, they're, they're huge. So um, I don't have the numbers. There's only one wind, there are only two wind co-ops in, in Ontario to date, the wind shared co-op that I mentioned that was built over 10 years ago and the Oxford Community Co-op. So I don't have the numbers on the, the wind side, but I, just as an example on the solar side, we have a solar co-op that I'm, I'm familiar with, I'm a member of, it's called SolarShare. They've, they've built almost three megawatts of projects and they're paying returns to the members almost a million dollars now. Um, and annually. So th annually. Uh, sorry, no, that's, it's cumulative. Cumul cumulative, they're still adding new projects, adding new members, so those numbers are changing all the time. The point is, these are, these are individuals that are they're invited to the annual dinner meeting, they can stand for the board of directors, they can see the system generating, they get involved as ambassadors of this co-op, and, and they're getting a uh, financial return. And okay. so Jane, that's really, I think, what needs to happen. Let me flip the question around for you, Jane, and that is if we gave every local municipality, which didn't want one of these turbines in their backyard, a veto over that, might we be in a situation where we have none at all in the province of Ontario and maybe we need this renewable power? I, it's really difficult to comment on a situation that we don't have. I mean, you'd look at uh, different types of renewable power. There has been a shift towards huge developments and not the small ones. And I can think of a number of communities that wanted to have their own power generation. There's one uh, in a community south of Ottawa, for example, wants to do a run of river. The community totally supports it. Uh, it would not harm anyone. It would not bother anyone. Um, they can't get the time of day from this government. Uh, the government's all about the big, big wind. So uh, we, don't, we don't even know what that would look like to have a community uh, a process where communities would get to decide, uh, yes, you need to produce some kind of power. That's the other thing, though. The rural communities in Ontario feel that they've been sacrificed for the large municipalities. Can we talk some brass knuckle politics here as well? The Liberals, I don't think, hold well, I, I was going to say none, but they hold very, very few seats in rural Ontario these days, maybe just a few. I, is that part of what's going on here? I don't think it works that way. I think it's just the rural communities have been where the progressive conservative party is strong. So it's not a them or us situation. For the conservatives, it is us. It, it, that's their communities. And that's the way that politics has worked out. I guess but. what I'm wondering is, do you, th do you think there's anybody inside this Liberal government who has said, look, these folks didn't vote for us, they didn't give us their seats, so... Tough. We have spoken with some Liberal uh, MPPs who have said, I'm sorry the way things are going, I understand your concerns, but this is the way the government's proceeding. So just to be uh, wearing the red tie and be a Liberal doesn't necessarily mean you don't understand what's going on in the small communities. Okay, with just a couple of minutes left here, Ross, what further consultation would you like to see on this? Uh, well, it's a little hard to say at this point. I mean, the damage is already done. Um, What's the point in consulting at this point when um, 
the turbines are already up. Uh, I would have liked to see proper consultations done 10 years ago. In fact, I would have liked to see the government just take the advice in the cost-benefit analysis that they commissioned back in 2005, which looked at just replacing the coal-fired power plants with a, a mix of nuclear and gas, and it would have come in at a fraction of the cost and achieved their environmental goals. I, I don't know if that's true, because I do remember several energy ministers over the past 10 years all saying what the nuclear industry wants to build new energy uh, capacity in the Ontario system is a fortune and we can't afford it and that's one of the reasons I'm told they went to wind. But those same energy ministers keep appealing to that cost-benefit analysis as the basis of their decision to coal, close the coal-fired power plants and that report never recommended wind power. It recommended mm -hmm. going with a mix of nuclear and coal. Randy, is it too late to do anything about this for the people who are opposed to it? Certainly not, and I think uh, on the economic side we're seeing, like I said earlier, increases in the cost competitiveness and affordability of wind. So as a rate payer in Ontario, I'm glad that my government is taking measures to create environmentally friendly, clean, safe, affordable electricity generation for future generations. So it's, some, it's about building on the existing accomplishments and achievements that we've made and doing it in a very safe and environmentally conscious way, uh, zero carbon emissions and making it affordable for the ratepayer down the road, so that's important. I do have to ask this follow-up. The Canadian Wind Energy Association, your yes. association, yes. do you give money to the Liberal Party of Ontario? We give. We try to s distribute our political contributions accordingly across across the board fairly. So we've contributed to all of the major parties in Ontario over the years, and we'll probably continue to do that as long as we're able to, um, you know, c consult on policy and that we have a role here in Ontario. So in the 2014 June 2014 election, you gave money to the Liberals, the PC and the NDP? No, we did not. Actually, the Conservative Party, for the very first time in Ontario, we made a decision collectively within the association to not contribute to that party. Um, and uh, it was because they were specifically campaigning to cancel contracts, to throw our industry into disarray, and to reverse the progress that we've made. So it was a very um, precedent-setting and conscious decision of the association to not contribute to the Conservative Party this past election campaign. Understood. Okay, we are not finished with this subject, but we do want to thank uh, the four of you for participating so far. Jane, you stick around because you're not going anywhere yet. Thanks to Ross McKittrick, Professor of Economics at the University of Guelph and the Senior Fellow for the Fraser Institute. Ross, appreciate you, appreciate you being on the program again. Judith Lipp, the Executive Director from that uh, wonderful co-op world that you live in and <laughs> described so well. Uh, Brandy Gianetta, Gianetta, Ontario Regional Director, Canadian Wind Energy Association. Thanks so much. And Jane, you stick around, as I say. Up next, beyond the environmental and economic concerns, many of those in opposition voice health concerns with wind turbines, and we're going to shift gears and explore that right after this. Headaches, sleeplessness, tinnitus. These are but a few of the health effects that some living near wind turbines say they experience. Joining us now to examine those claims in San Diego, California, Chris Olson. He is Senior Environmental Health Scientist at Intrinsic Health Sciences. And we welcome back Jane Wilson of Wind Concerns Ontario. And uh, Chris, it's good to have you on the program today. You're, I guess you're a Mississauga guy originally, right? Yeah, that's right, Steve, and so I'm happy to join you from San Diego today. Very good. Well, you know, because you, you've heard about the documentary and seen chunks of it as well, that throughout the Big Wind documentary, which we're going to play right after this program, uh, several people do complain about health effects, and what we're going to do over the next 20 minutes or so is play several clips from the documentary and then get each of you to comment on them and give us your expertise. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, roll number one. Roll tape, please. Probably 60 or 65 percent of the circle right around me is I'm enclosed by windmills. And these here ones are far away, but th this here one is 659 meters away. You, you hear it now. That's the one that drives me crazy because it comes right to my the end of my big barn and bounces off the walls into the horse barn where I'm working all day. And it just, about two hours, and it just drives you nuts. Well, you end up with a headache. Yeah, you get a headache, and you, you blame that you can't see, it's too bright or something. Okay, Chris, that's the first criticism we hear most often. These things cause headaches. What does science tell us about that? 
Yeah, Steve, I think it's important to remember that there's no question that wind turbines have to be sited properly in order to, you know, avoid these types of issues. And there's no question that, you know, from the clip that you just played, that, you know, some people find the, the noise from the wind turbines annoying. However, when we look at the Health Canada study that was just recently released in 2014, we're not seeing that correlation between the loudness of the turbines and the headaches themselves. Jane, what's your response to that? The Health Canada study does show an association with wind turbine noise and uh, adverse health reactions. So people do have a, a range of problems. It's not everybody. Uh, Health Canada's results said 16.5%. Uh, other research shows around 15 can be more than that, but it's not no association. If it's 16.5%, it, let's give you that. All right, sorry, Chris, you wanted to come in on that? Well, yeah, I mean, Steve, I think it's important to remember that the 16.5% that Ms. Wilson's talking about was people reported being annoyed by the noise. It wasn't health effects at 16.5%. Quite simply, if you do look at the results of the Health Canada study, they did not show that correlation. They certainly said that 16.5% of people may be annoyed from living around the wind turbines themselves. Jane? Annoyed can be a medical term meaning stress or distress. And that again is, uh, you know, that's what the Health Canada study showed. And it was showed at 25% at around 550 meters, which is what the Ontario setback is. So it clearly shows there's problems with the Ontario regulations. Has anybody conclusively determined that the noise made by these turbines does in fact cause headaches? Headaches is a, one of the number of, the, there's a suite of problems and everyone is different. Some people don't have a headache, they complain more of a feeling of fullness in their head or pressure in the chest, but everyone's going to respond differently to them, but headaches is certainly one of the things that you see reported. And Chris, can you say categorically that there is no association whatsoever between adverse health effects and these turbines? No, Steve, I mean, again, I think it's important to remember is that we have noise siting guidelines, whether they be for turbines or other sources of unwanted noise. And quite simply, if we look at it again, in Ontario, the noise guideline is 40 decibels. And maybe put that in perspective for your viewers. If they were to shut their TVs off right now, the kids were locked in the basement, they couldn't hear them. Their homes would typically be in the high 30s or low 40 decibel range already. And so why we have that noise setback and distance is to make sure that people can get a good night's sleep. And I would suggest that again, if you take a look at the Health Canada study, the recently released several million dollar comprehensive study that's been done, they actually did not see an association with health effects and the wind turbines themselves. They did show that there was an association with annoyance, but quite simply not with the health effects, whether they be self-reported or measured indicators that they looked at as well. So you're making a distinction between cause and association, and you think it's important we understand that difference, is that right? Yeah, I think it's very important to understand that difference. I mean, what we're looking at is that certainly there, you're looking to see whether or not the wind turbines themselves or anything coming from the wind turbines, such as the noise or shadow flicker or other um, issues that people tend to associate with the wind turbines, are they actually causing either directly or indirectly an effect on people's health? And the Health Canada study suggests that that is not the case. And it backs up the last decade of research that we've seen from around the world in this area. Okay, let's roll our second piece of, uh, got to stop saying tape. Ro let's roll our second clip from the Big Wind documentary. Roll it, Sheldon. This is the barn. There's no livelihood here now. You can't have cattle here unless you want to torture them. The cattle, even in 2008, we were still having cattle that were bleeding out of their noses when they come here. We've never seen cattle bleed out of their nose. You'd have to watch them, they'd run you down. Yeah. We had a bull that actually had burnt feet. We have stray voltage, it comes through. It's like in the house. You wear your shoes because your feet burn so bad in the house. Okay, Jane, clearly some disturbing facts there. Can you say conclusively that these problems were caused by the turbines? 
No, again, uh, you know, they brought the animal aspect in here, and there aren't any animal studies being done in Ontario. So, uh, and they also brought in the, the noise, but also the stray voltage issue, which is something else again. So that is something that's being looked at, uh, you know, by the farm community, certainly. And, you know, she mentioned there, there's no livelihood. I've heard of people that can't have sheep and goats. They seem to be more sensitive. But there's no data on that. There's no studies on that. We just know people are telling us that, that there's a big problem. Chris, we've heard also in the documentary people complaining who live near turbines that it feels like there are ants crawling all over their faces all the time because of the itchiness and the, they would say, because of the too close proximity of the turbines. Can you con conclusively say that the turbines had nothing to do with that? No, Steve, I mean, I think it's important to come back to that clip and, and, and what was just discussed. I mean, there are over 100,000 turbines now located around the world. The vast majority of those are on farm properties, farm country, whether they be in North America or across Europe. And simply, I mean, when we address the issue around the livestock and, and the cattle bleeding from the nose, one has to look at it. Is there a plausible biological mechanism by which there's something in being emitted from the turbines themselves that could result in that being the case? And, and quite simply, I would put to you and your viewers that there is not. And when we look at all of these turbines all over the world, we don't see these reporting widespread reports of livestock issues. And there have certainly been a number of studies that have been completed in Europe and, and elsewhere on livestock and the fact that the turbines themselves are not a, an issue for livestock or domesticated animals. What about this notion of stray voltage being created by the turbines? Anything to that? Yeah, I mean, stray voltage is not a new phenomenon in rural Ontario. I mean, it, it's always been a problem. I come from a long line of farmers up in the Meaford area, and certainly when you have stray voltage, it can be dealt with. Turbines itself, and to be clear, I'm not an electrical engineer, but I certainly have spent some time around this issue, is that if, for some reason, once the turbines go up and there are problems, if there was ever to be a problem in stray voltage, it's something that can be investigated and easily fixed. But the issues around stray voltage, and as described <clears throat> in that video clip, quite simply in the literature of stray voltage in farm animals, again, we don't see these being issues with farm animals from a stray voltage. It, typically what the farm animals will do is they'll avoid you know, drinking out of a, a water bowl that has a stray voltage issue. So we're not, there's not a biological mechanism for that. If stray voltage occurs, my understanding it's relatively easily fixed and should be fixed by the developers if there is such an issue. Jane, fair to say that throughout rural Ontario there are hydroelectric transmission lines that also create stray voltage and this is nothing new for rural Ontario. Uh, that's true with the dairy operations in particular you see uh, that they do have an issue with stray voltage but there are some uh, uh, reports about the stray voltage from the wind. Again, I mentioned uh, Ridgetown, again, is an uh, area where they've had some stray voltage. It's almost like that scene from the movie The Money Pit, where uh, voltage was going through the house and, you know, zapping uh, currents through the walls, and uh, um, that's not the normal uh, thing. But again, nobody's studying that, so. You think somebody should be? I think somebody should be studying all of this, yes. Who should that be? Well, uh, we need independent institutions to be looking at, at the whole issue. You know, uh, Sir Austin Bradford Hill was this uh, largely regarded as the father of epidemiology, and he said, if you have reports of a health problem and you do research and you don't get an answer, you don't just say, well, we've done. You say, there's a problem. These people are having a problem for some reason. You go back and go back and go back until you get the answer. That's not happening in Ontario. Do you think Health Canada or the Ontario but, Ministry of Health are independent enough to do these studies? Uh, the Health Canada study was oddly done by a regulatory branch. Uh, uh, they could be if they did the proper study design. In this case, that study was never set up to, f uh, to see cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Um, and also the whole study but, is not out. All we're dealing with really is a brief summary that they released in November. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, Steve, if I may. I mean, Wing Concerns and other groups, <clears throat> including myself and my research team, have been calling for studies to be done in Canada. And Health Canada did undertake that study. And I, I think in fairness to Health Canada, the research team that was involved in that study, very well respected internationally in noise and health research, 
In addition to the Health Canada researchers themselves, they involved statisticians from Statistics Canada, and they had an international panel of experts that oversaw the study. I don't know what more we could be doing to satisfy this issue. I mean, certainly they, Health Canada took the concern seriously and spent over $2 million investigating the issue. And what they found was consistent with the body of literature that we've had for the last decade in this area. If people are having problems, they certainly need to be seen by their physicians. They certainly need to have things investigated. But quite clearly, we're seeing that it's very unlikely that the turbines in many of these cases would be the issue. All right, let's go on to our next issue, and that is proximity. There are many people who've been complaining that if the turbines are too close to their homes or their farms, there is an impact, an adverse health impact. Let's roll the next clip and find out about that one. Sheldon, please. Residents here are living less than 1,500 meters in the turbines. In, in, in Europe, and we've talked about this a little bit in the past, we've had more experience with this. What, what kind of setbacks do we have there? Minimally, the standard should be 2,000 kilometers, or 2,000 yeah. meters. And certainly in, in some areas with the really high towers, probably a lot farther. Yeah. Uh, most of them are probably too close. Three years ago, there wasn't very much in any journal. Now there's a lot of material on acoustics, in particular ear, nose, and throat physicians uh, saying, yeah, indeed, there is a physiological reason why people exposed to repetitive pulsing sound could get these symptoms. Yeah. Chris, you've got some experts saying that these turbines should be no closer than 2,000 meters uh, from somebody's property. Ontario allows 500 meters. Do we have a problem here? No, Steve, I mean, again, let's put this into context. There, there are very limited jurisdictions around the world, and the one I believe that Dr. Lynn was referring to in her clip is a particular state in Australia where they've made a policy decision to set the turbines back 2,000 meters or two kilometers from people's homes. Most jurisdictions around the world, in fact, allow the turbines to be set on a noise basis. And I think that's the more important way to go, is that we need to keep these things at a low enough lo noise level to keep people getting a good night's sleep and avoiding the adverse health effects. Ontario, not only do you have to be a half kilometer back, but you also have to be under 40 decibels outside the people's homes in order to ensure compliance with the regulation. To put that in context, we have many states and many jurisdictions in Europe where the noise level is 45 or even 50 decibels and these turbines are located a lot closer. So my preference is to say it on a sound basis, not on a distance basis. And the two kilometer setback certainly doesn't have a basis in protection of health that I'm aware of. Jane, does that make sense to you? Be more worried about the decibels as opposed to the distance? Uh, well, the di they're, they're par partners in the whole thing. I mean, that's what goes together there. But Dr. Lynn, who's a medical officer of health in that clip, she was talking about the rhythmic pulsing. So that's not audible noise. That is inaudible noise or the infrasound, which Ontario has no standards for. Sorry, infrasound? In infrasound. Infrasound. Which Ontario has no uh, standards for and is not measuring. They're supposed to be coming up with something in 2015. That's the rhythmic pulsing that Dr. Lynn was referring to, and that is very bothersome to a lot of people. Let's hear some. So Sheldon, Steve. have you got some? Stand by one second, Chris. I think we've got some video of this. Let's just, and I'm going to stop talking, let's play it and listen. Okay, Jane, you can pretty clearly hear the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh of the thing. But the question is, is that so significant as to make people unhealthy? When you hear that, the whoosh, that, when that's when the blade goes past the mast, mm -hmm. uh, if you're listening to that, some of the people describe it as like a torture, like they're just hearing that all night long. Um, and they're wakened up from their sleep at night. So it, it really isn't hard to understand. If people can't sleep, they're gonna get sick. It doesn't matter whether it's wind turbines, traffic, whatever. But the infrasound, again, that's the inaudible noise. That's the other thing that is causing uh, an anxiety reaction. Uh, it's a stress reaction in people, and they're responding to that. Chris, your view? Yeah, Steve, I mean, maybe to put again into context what this infrasound is. Infrasound is quite simply the low range of the sound uh, scale where we don't hear it. So the infrasound is a, is a sound that we don't hear, and it's under a what we say a 20 hertz. What has long been um, a question is that, and, and Ms. Wilson is right, we don't typically measure infrasound or low frequency noise from these turbines, but in the recent years we have been, including in the Health Canada study, 
including a number of other researchers, as well as a research paper that we just published, and that although there is infrasound and low-frequency noise emitted from these turbines, it's quite simply at levels that are reach either background or well below any health concern that you would have once you're at a half kilometer back from people's homes. Okay, a couple of minutes so to go here. I can't subscribe to the notion that wind turbines and infrasound are somehow special. Understood. A couple of minutes to go here. Let's do one more excerpt, if we can, from the documentary, Big Wind. Like I said, if they're passing the cookies around, I'm going to take one. And uh, it's been going good. Cookies can add up to $10,000 per turbine each year. No doubt sweetening the sound of the wind. Once in a while you can hear them if you want to. If we decide that we don't want to uh, hear them, and it's fine with us. And uh, some people are, are fixated on, on certain things and, and it bothers them to, uh, to no end. And we decide we, we are not. Jane, not only that gentleman, but there was another older gentleman in the course of the documentary who had a very dramatic confrontation with somebody who said, I think this is all in your head. Uh, I've been living next door to these things for a decade and I've never been sick a day in my life. So said this other gentleman. Uh, do you have a tough case to make here? No, no one's saying that everyone is affected by it. Uh, you know, 15%, if you take that's on the conservative end of the scale. But when you're talking like a, a wind power project like the one in Niagara region being proposed and it's a, a, in appeal right now, uh, over hundreds of people would be exposed to that and just the 15% would be almost 400 people within two kilometers. That's a lot of people and a lot of children who didn't ask for this. So, um, you know, again, we're not saying everyone is affected. I must correct Mr. Olson too, the type of infrasound produced by turbines is unique. It is not the same as the infrasound produced by traffic or air, uh, air traffic or the ocean. It's very different. Chris, you want to come back on that? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I mean, I think with Steve, what we, we need to remind ourselves is that 15% that we're discussing is not 15% of people are going to get sick. That is not what the evidence says. It's not what Health Canada's study came out. It says around 15% at this noise level of around 40 decibels may experience annoyance. And it's quite simply, they, it's, it's a scale that we look at the unwanted sound. It is not that these people are going to get sick. It's not that we're subjecting 15% of rural Ontarians to be, be made ill by these turbines. It's just that they may not want the noise there itself. And I can understand that from a nuisance and annoyance standpoint. But when we look at your farmer's clip there where he says that he's lived around these turbines for a long time, that's another piece of the evidence and, and as we look through these things is that people who do economically benefit certainly don't actually experience this annoyance. And it's a very common phenomenon with noise. So although there may be 15% or up to 15% of Ontarians who may not want to live with the noise that they're experiencing around wind turbines, it's not saying that we're making them sick. Chris, I got a minute left here and I, I really don't mean to be a smart ass when I ask this question, but where do you live? I actually live uh, just outside of Hamilton, Steve. Okay, um, no turbines up there, right? Now, again, Steve, I mean, I, I deal with a lot of environmental health issues right across the world, and I certainly can't live everywhere by where I'm going to be. There won't be a turbine that'll be located 550 meters from my house, because I have neighbors there, I have the highway, I have traffic. But again, I'd like to bring it back to you. I come from a long line of farmers in rural Ontario. I certainly have people that live around wind turbines in my family. No, I get you, but the, I guess the, the final question is, would you live near one? Of course I would, or I would be on the program here discussing it with you, Steve. So, but the, the reality is I won't be at any time soon because I'm not going to be moving. But I certainly, my family, I would be comfortable with the guidelines that are set in the province of Ontario living next door. Understood. I want to thank both of you for coming on the program tonight and helping us out with this. Chris Olson, Senior Environmental Health Scientist with Intrinsic Environmental Sciences. He's in San Diego, California. Jane Wilson, President of Wind Concerns Ontario. Thanks for making the trip in all the way from Eastern Ontario to be with us tonight, Jane. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.